doubt is one of the hindrances in meditation. But it turns out that there are different kinds of doubt. There are actually some kinds of doubt that are helpful. The hindrances, or the doubt as a hindrance, is the kind of doubt that makes you afraid to do anything, makes you unwilling to commit. When you try something, it says, well, this can't be right. And then you go someplace else before you've even given it a chance, given it a try. For example, a com common complaint about concentration is you, as you begin to fabricate it, you notice, hey, this is fabricated. This is willed. There's got to be something wrong there. You think that concentration should be something that happens naturally. Sometimes it does, but other times you really have to will it. You really have to work it. After all, it's part of the Noble Eightfold Path. The Eightfold Path is something fabricated. Concentration itself is a fabricated thing. The problem here is actually you're, you're doubting the wrong thing. Instead of doubting the, the practice, you should be doubting your preconceived notions, things that you haven't really put to a test. That's a healthy kind of doubt, because it's through that kind of doubt that you start being observant. So many times we believe this must be right, that must be right, and we just plow ahead regardless of the consequences. Because it seems so logical, it seems so reasonable. But as the Buddha said, you can't take logic and reason as your guide all the time. Because some things that are logical and reasonable are actually wrong. Sometimes they're right. So they're, the logic and the reason there are not a guarantee of their truth. So this is a fine line. And you're to figure out exactly what you should doubt and what you shouldn't. If it's a kind of doubt that paralyzes you, makes you unable to do anything or commit to anything, well, that's unskillful doubt. But if it's a kind of doubt that questions a preconceived notion, that opens the opportunity to be observant. As I've said many times, this is one of the most frequent terms that John Fuang used in giving meditation instruction, was be observant, watch what you do, look at the results of what you're doing. If you're not observant, there's no way the meditation is going to go anywhere. You might like to think that meditation is something simple. It has certain set instructions, and you follow A, B, C, D, and you finally get to Z, which is where you want to go, and that's, and that's it. And the less you think and the less you reflect, the better a meditator you'll be. Well, that's totally wrong. How are you going to gain discernment unless you look at cause and effect for yourself? If you simply follow instructions, then you're placing all the responsibility on the instructor. You're taking no responsibility at all for your actions. If anything goes wrong, it's that other person's fault. That's a very cautious way of looking at the world, trying to make sure that nobody can criticize you, but that it doesn't gain any real results. The whole point of the meditation is that while you're doing the meditation, unexpected things are going to come up, things that you wouldn't see otherwise. And it's how you deal with those unexpected things, what understandings you come to about those unexpected things. That's where the real discernment arises. That's where you can really make a change in the mind. So the purpose of the instructions is to give you general principles and some warnings. And if you hit this particular part, you've got to watch out for this. You hit protect that particular stage, you've got to watch out for that. But a lot of it is used, is left up to your own powers of observation. And if you're not willing to use your powers of observation, you get nowhere. It's as plain as that. If you're not willing to question your preconceived notions, well, you might as well go back home, because the meditation is designed to do precisely that, question your preconceived notions. And 
If you don't question them, you don't learn anything new. If you don't learn anything new, nothing will happen in the mind. So you have to be a questioning person. You also have to learn how to question the right things. And some of this you can pick up from people who have meditated before, who have some experience. Notice how they look at things, because I noticed when I was with the John Fung, there wasn't all that much that he explained in a very systematic way. There was more hints and suggestions. Try this. If that doesn't work, well, try that. And if that doesn't work, well, use your ingenuity, use your powers of observation. In other words, you can't expect everything to be handed to you on a platter, because otherwise what will you do if the platter isn't there? You run across a particular problem, and if you're not used to approaching it from different angles, trying out different solutions, you're lost. So this is why the ability to be observant on a day-to-day -day level is such an important prerequisite for being observant as a meditator. Look for the unexpected. Be sensitive to nuance, because the mind has lots of nuances. It's not a machine. It wasn't designed by an engineer who was thinking logically and systematically. It has its, it's a chaotic system. Chaotic systems are often unpredictable, they ha and you've got to feel for them over time. In a nonverbal way. By trying this, trying that, see what works, see what doesn't work. And then what seems to work right now, well, try it again tomorrow, see if it works again tomorrow, because maybe the mind will have changed in the meantime. You haven't made a minor discovery, not a major discovery. And so you look again, observe again, ask questions again. And over time, the body of knowledge that comes from the powers of observation will build up. And that's a lot more trustworthy than the knowledge that simply you gain from books, you gain from words, or that you sort of thought through on your own. The Buddha talks about three levels of discernment. There's the discernment that comes from listening and reading, and the discernment that comes from thinking things through. And John Lee compared the first to elementary education and the second to high school education. But the really useful one is, is, is the discernment that comes from developing qualities in the mind. And this is an important quality, being observant. It's part of the whole practice of mindfulness and alertness. Alertness is a, a matter of watching what you do and seeing what comes about as a result. And if you refuse to learn from your actions, there's no alertness. It goes nowhere. But if you learn from your actions, because then you're developing good qualities in the mind. And in the process of developing, you come to your own understanding of what mindfulness really is about. What's the difference between mindfulness and alertness? How do they relate? How do they do good things for the mind? How do they enable you to see things that you didn't see before? That kind of discernment can really have an a telling effect on the mind, an important effect on the mind, open you up to new things, that, as the Buddha said, to reach the as-yet-unreached, to attain the as-yet-unattained, to realize the as-yet-unrealized. If you're looking for the meditation simply to confirm the things that you already know, well, it will do that, but it won't be worth much. An important part of discernment is seeing the new things that you didn't see before that will have an effect on the mind, that will change the mental landscape. One of John Lee's 
shorthand ways of developing discernment. So when you come to an understanding, ask yourself, well, what if the opposite is true? In what ways would the, uh, the opposite being true make a difference? What ways would it be useful? That's why you have two eyes and not just one. When you have two eyes, you gain perspective. You see things as three-dimensional and not just two. So try to be a person with two eyes. Learn to question. Force yourself to be observant, if you're not already observant. Because that's where the path lies. It doesn't lie in hammering things out from your preconceived notions. This is why there's so much emphasis on letting go. It's not just letting go of material things or sensual pleasures. Many times it means letting go of the things that you hold most firmly to as being right. So learn to question precisely those things.